Uh, I'm really glad to see you here. It's four in the evening on Saturday, so I think a lot of people start getting out of here. So I'm really glad to hear that many people. And today I will try to talk to you about uh, backups of CEF, because we know that there are two kinds of people, right? Those who do backups and those who don't. And actually there's a third group of people, those who do backups but don't know how to restore them. Yeah, so always remember to also try to restore your backups. And my talk will be mostly about uh, our experience at OVH, the company I'm working in, uh, and the story how we get to current point uh, in time. So, my name is Bartek Świenski, uh, and daily, my daily job is uh, working at OVH at Wrocław in Poland, uh, where we have a research and development center, and my current focus is on bringing awesomeness to our CEF infrastructure. So, quick show of hands, who does not know CEF? Okay, a few people. Who, who does not know OVH? Okay, also a few people. So, very quickly about CEF itself, we've seen a few introductions already. But this is an uh, open source project. The most important fact is open source right now developed and under the umbrella of Red Hat. Um, it's meant to be a network storage with different access methods. Uh, and it should be perfect solution for large scale deployments. So it should scale out very, uh, very easily. It should be reliable. So if there's any problem, it should detect it. And once it detects it, it should be able to recover from the situation by guarantee that it heals the data that is lost. Mm, and last but not least, it's very fast. So when you take a look at the history of Ceph, they put really a lot of effort into making this very fast platform and squeeze out the last bit of performance from your hardware. And that's why actually we like it at OVH, uh, because we want to have fast things. And Basically, how much do we like it? We like it because we have 40 petabytes of raw hard drive storage that we need to manage somehow. And it's growing. And it's funny because last time I was presenting, we had 30 petabytes. And it was, I think, half a year ago. So the growth is really fast. Uh, and it is, it is a lot. It is really a lot. And uh, we don't put everything into one cluster. Uh, because we split it into smaller parts. Right now we operate around 150 clusters in our infrastructures. Um, those are both our internals and external ones. And uh, our base workflow uh, are RBD images in OpenStack. And that's where we put focus on our backup infrastructure. So. I just said that Ceph is reliable, right? It will heal itself, it would replicate data. Oh, I didn't say that, but it will replicate data and also consider your physical infrastructure. So we'll make sure that it's replicated, for instance, across racks, not inside one server. So if we have all these benefits of Ceph, why do we need to backup? We have three copies, right? Like, can't we consider it backup? Um, could, we could, but... Yeah, better safe than sorry. Uh, so we always can find some kind of software bugs. We don't know when it would strike, but, uh, and we haven't yet seen something that would destroy our data, but we know that bugs happen. Right? And it's better to be prepared for that kind of situation. And bugs can happen in Ceph, let's say, but also in the lower parts of the stack. So let's say that there is a bug in the Linux kernel something in the file system layer. Then you start erasing data. We want to be protected from that kind of situation. Also, there is a software running on our hard drives. And uh, it can happen that it sometimes just behaves differently than what it was expected to do. So that's one thing. The second thing is that we want to be prepared for a disaster. Um, and when we are working at the scale, like at OVH scale, the probabilities stop getting intuitive, like the probability of hardware, uh, hard drive failure. 
So if you have a laptop, if you have desktop, you can expect that you will replace your hard drive in a few years, right? Because for two years, the hard drive should work. When we have a few thousand hard drives, you can expect that hard drives will be dying daily. And remember, we have three copies. So if three hard drives die at the same time, we just lost our data, right? It's very, very unlikely, but we already had a situation where two hard drives died at the same time. And Ceph is very good at that situation because when you lose two copies out of three, it just blocks traffic to the cluster. Uh, our clients would complain, but it would start to copy the data as fast as it can, so it has at least two copies. That's the usual setup. So Ceph helps here, but as I said before, better safe than sorry. Um, also, we've seen, because we are using Firestore, that's, uh, let's say, uh, original uh, data layer, layer for Ceph, and it uses XFS file system, which tends to have problems where there is a power failure. So we've seen that when you just shut down the power and bring back the machine, XFS cannot recover. So that means that if we have big power failure, and we know that big power failures happen, uh, we may have problems, right? Hopefully we didn't have this yet, but let's be prepared. But when you take a look at the statistics, what's the, most, uh, the, the biggest factor for losing data? It's always human, right? Operators. Always operators, right? So let's be prepared for a situation where someone has, let's say, very hard duty and uh, just types something, mistypes in the command line, and then, you know, you, you have this feeling that you just feel cold because you just did something wrong, right? And we want to be protected for that. And also, because we are, we are giving services for our clients, I can assure you that sooner or later, there will be someone that came to you and say, uh, I have lost my data. Please, please, can you recover it for me? Um, because even if we do backups, not always our clients do. Right? And it will be very good to be able to help that kind of client in the situation, especially if he says, I will give a lot of money for this, right? Yeah. Also, uh, when we talk about Ceph, still, um, Ceph works very well when it's in a local territory, where not within the cluster can quickly connect together. So if we start putting data in the data center very far away, the pink uh, cross, uh, Ceph has performance issues, and it's not yet fully ready to handle this kind of situation, geograph geographical replica replication. Uh, and we, of course, know that the best backup is a backup somewhere far away. Right? I'm not talking about uh, Mars here, but the other side of the globe will be the best way. So we need to ha somehow uh, overcome this and be prepared also for this kind of scenario. And I see that in, inside itself itself, there is a lot of effort to bring this kind of geographical replication um, back up. Uh, right now, you can do this for RBDs, uh, but it's very early and it doesn't yet scale well. Mm, so we have to have something instead. Right? We, take, uh, we, we try to uh, take a look into this, and we see also that there's uh, an effort to uh, back up also Rados layer if someone is interested. So I've seen some rumors, so it will be very, very good uh, solution in the future, but we need something for today. So, uh, we know what we want, so let's do some planning. So we started planning at OVH uh, what we want to do with our backups. So let's first think about backup software. We need to have some kind of software that will back up our infrastructure. And we made few assumptions. What do we want? Yeah, we want something that would do compression. Why? Because if we compress data, we will need less back backup storage, right? Less, it means uh, cheaper, and of course, we can upload it faster. Also, we would like to have some kind of deduplication. Uh, why? Because sometimes we will be backing up something a uh, few times in a row, right? So we have our one RBD image. The next time we back up it, we can compare it with the previous content, and there will be only a small difference between those two. Um, also, we want to have encryption. That was one of our really main goals. So we don't want anything to leave our clusters unencrypted. This is customer data. 
So uh, uh, even if we're talking uh, inside our VH network, right? We want to keep the data of the clients only inside our clusters. Uh, so everything that leaves that must be encrypted. Also, we want something that is speed, yeah, because we have a lot of data to back up. Um, and because exporting data from Ceph is using RBD export, we want to be able to process stream of data. Not a file, it's just a stream of data, just send it to the backup and everything sh should work. And we also wanted to support OpenStack Swift. Another funny thing, because uh, we already have OpenStack Swift in uh, OVH, and this is totally separate thing from Ceph. Uh, this is separate code, this is separate team, so if something wrong happens in Ceph, whether this will be a Ceph bug or something in our uh, management infrastructure, uh, the separate team should already sh should still be fine, right? So even if in our case we just broke everything, other team should have the data. Yeah. So, and we didn't find that kind of solution, unfortunately. So instead, we tried to look at OVH. What experience do we have? And it turned out that there's a com there's a team that is doing something similar, uh, backups of. Uh, the images, and they are using something called Duplicity, which is an open source uh, software to, to basically do backups. Right? And, and we decided to use this because we already have a knowledge how this works and what are critics. There were some things that they said initially even that we have to consider. Um, but still, we, we are also analyzing uh, alternatives. There is a very nice promising project called Restic. Uh, it's still pretty young and it doesn't have, have compression but it uh, looks like it may be our replacement in the future. Okay, so we selected software, let's think about resources. Uh, so we had to do some assumptions because we don't know what kind of data our clients have. So we assumed 30%, uh, so if we compress the data, they duplicate it, let's say that uh, we left with only 30% of original data. Uh, also, we want to reuse as much of our internal infrastructure as possible. So, that, as I said already, we used uh, internal uh, OVH Swift cluster. Um, and also, we knew that we will need compute powers because we need to all do this compression, the duplication. Right? So, uh, we decided to use just OVH Cloud, yeah, where you spawn virtual machines and you can very easily spawn new ones, destroy ones. So that seems very flexible, and if there are any problems with resources, there are dedicated teams to handle those problems, right? So it's less burden for us. Okay, so let's also do some example calculations. At that time, we had 20 petabytes of raw data. We have three copies, so when we divide one by uh, 20 by three, we have 6.6 .6 petabytes of data, and let's say that we want to back up this daily. Yeah? So let's just divide the numbers. 20, uh, 281 gigabytes per hour to back up. So 4.7 gigabytes per minute. 0 0.078 gigabytes per second. So throughput of around 0 0.63 gigabits per second. So it doesn't sound that bad, right? We usually operate on 40 gigabit NICs, so we should be able to handle this. Similarly, we calculated this for raw hard drive speeds. You can calculate how fast it can work. And results were that we can basically back up everything in a few hours, right, if we are happy. And this is initial design. So we have self cluster. Uh, of course, for the image, uh, we need to create a snapshot. So to have it in kind of consistent state, because we don't want to back up something that's changing. Right, then we export this stuff through some kind of backup view to our machine. Uh, also, we containerize some of our infrastructure to, to be separate from uh, differences between sub versions and uh, to have local storage clean up automatically. Put, we put this into duplicity and then throw out to our Swift, um, Swift storage. Right? So it looks fine. So let's see how it works in practice. So we started implementing it and very soon we started getting challenges. Okay, so first, first thing to hammer is duplicity. Yeah, our selection of the software have some limits. 
first limit is it doesn't work with the data streams. It just works with files. Right? So what we do, we take the RBD image, just back up it locally, right, and export this local copy of data to duplicity. Yeah, um, yeah, we have backup VMs. And we have local storage of, let's say, 500 gigabit, gigabytes at most. But some of our clients have two terabytes of images. Can we handle this? Yeah. We thought that the, we can use uh, hole punching in Linux kernel. So if we dump something into the local file system, it has a lot of zeros. We will just eliminate those zeros. And maybe we will be lucky to, to just put those gigabits uh, into a much lower space. Uh, but no, it didn't work out. Um, so um, we actually, um, well, I think I just moved to the nec to next problem. But um, um, we also have problems with duplicity because it doesn't tolerate l large files. Right? If you go beyond, let's say, a few hundred megabytes, uh, the rsync algorithm that's used inside duplicity start having some performance issues. So you just have CPUs at the top, just wait for the backup. A few hours later, you still wait for the backup, and nothing works, right? So our colleagues at OVH said that, yeah, you need to split. You need to split, you need to chop into smaller pieces. Only You can backup only smaller pieces, and that's what we started doing. So when we dump stuff onto local hard drive, so that Duplicity can, can backup it, we just split into 256 megabyte chunks. It turned out to be pretty good. We don't have to split into lower amounts. Um, duplicity was able to handle this size pretty well. Right? And the problem that I just talked before, yeah, we have large, large images. And we have basically uh, limited local space. So we also need to split the whole RBD image into chunks. We call these chunks and back up such a large image in parts, each part separately. Uh, so it took us some time to implement and fix all the issues. And basically, that's the uh, architecture. So we start with self-cluster and RBD image and a snapshot. We just cut it into pieces. That's the first layer of the cut. Uh, out of this cut, we have 25 gigabyte chunks. And then we have to split those chunks into files. Each file is 20, 256 megabytes. Put it into local SSD drive. And then we can put it out into duplicity. And finally, go to Swift. Yeah, so we made it. <laughs> um, it took us a few months. But uh, this is right now uh, what's working on our production. And it works really well. So really, we don't have to care what la how large images our clients have. And I've seen 30 terabytes once, so <laughs> it is pretty pretty large. And we can handle it with this system. Of course, the time needed to, to back up will be proportionally bigger. Um, but it works. Um, OK, but we also thought about some alternatives. Yeah, We have a lot of splitting here, a lot of files here some local storage here, maybe we could do better. And yes, we can. Yeah, QS, file system in user space. So very, very nice mechanism in Linux kernel world. So basically, you create user space application that just do a virtual file system somewhere in a directory. Uh, so if we create this kind of Fuse client, what we can do? We can do all we did previously with files and with this chopping. So we can just initially select only portion of the RBD image, then internally inside the memory, chop it into smaller pieces and expose this as already chopped series of images. And just put it through duplicity. It should take it as it, if it was, were just standard files. So we made this client. Uh, right now, it's uh, in testing. Uh, it's very promising because basically we don't need any local space. So what we take from the cluster, the Fuse client just sucks it into the memory. Then when the client requests the data, yeah, it just throws it out directly to the some Linux kernel world. I don't know where. <laughs> basically, it just travels then back to the duplicity and it sends it back. Yeah, um, 
Backing up was pretty simple. We had some problems with restoring data. Yeah, because duplicity has its own rules, right? So for instance, when you start restoring stuff in duplicity, it just erases everything at the directory of the destination. Yeah, so uh, you need to pretend that you handle removals, and then when files start to appear, you just need to handle the situation. And of course, keep in mind that you cannot show that there are some files where they are still not uploaded yet. Yeah? So tricky situation, but we have a very, very bright colleague, and he implemented this. And we plan to put this into our production uh, pretty soon just to remove the need for local SSD uh, space because that's currently uh, one of our limiting factors because we need just a lot of VMs with reasonable amount size of local hard drive space. Okay. Um, okay, so let's talk also about something else, impact of on our production because when we start reading data from our clusters, we can expect that it will affect our clients uh, so from the beginning, we knew that we have to throttle the backup system. We have to be able to very easily shape uh, the amount of data that falls through it. Uh, that's why we implemented a few uh, layers where we can basically just you know, have this valve and rotate it and even, even put mod into backup or just reduce it. So um, one of that valves was maybe because we use Celery tasks. So Celery is the task processing architecture. It has workers. So the amount of workers which we have spawned is basically the number of simultaneous backups we have in the system. So by just spawning more workers or reducing the amount of workers, we can easily just do more or less parallel backups in whole system. But still, we want to protect one cluster. Right? So we implemented some limits. For instance, how many things can be backed up in one cluster at a, at a time? Um, we also want to limit the time when we backup. So when we schedule new backups, for instance, we can say that schedule this only during night because there is a, mm, clients don't do much on this cluster. Um, also, uh, when we have those backups virtual machines, right? So we have a virtual machine that has, let's say, 200 gigab gigabyte hard drive, and uh, we need to put n backups there, each of 25 gigabytes, because that's the, the chunk size, right? So we don't want to cross some limits here. So each backup VM at one time can accept no more than some a calculated value, right? Some calculated number of backups. Uh, and for one RBD image, we decided that there must be only one backup. So we have to either finish the backup or just cancel it. It just simplified everything. Mm. And all those limits we implemented using uh, Zookeeper and some semaphores and logs which are built on top of uh, Zookeeper, basically. Okay, so let's see how it scales. Of course, we have issues. Yeah, and scaling uh, always shows some issues. Even if we test it locally, if we try to uh, do some simulation, you can never predict what will happen at a large scale at the production. So Zookeeper, <laughs> our decision yeah, sometimes has a problems because Zookeeper is good for rarely changing data. So it will distribute the data in, the, in its own cluster, but when you start doing frequent changes, once in a while there will be a snapshot. A snapshot takes a hard drive space. So if you do a lot of changes and acquiring logs and semaphores do a lot of changes, then you have alerts that you run out of space, right? Because there's a lot of snapshots. And uh, what we did, we just increased the number of transactions uh, after which the Zookeeper would do uh, a snapshot. Yeah, and basically that fixed our problems with uh, Zookeeper. Also, it turned out that we have problems with salary workers uh, because uh, it has some problems with memory. Uh, sometimes just memory spikes. Also has a problem with CPU when there are connectivity issues. And we put this into our virtual machines. So in virtual machines, you don't have a flat CPU characteristics. So sometimes you have a lot of CPU, sometimes you just saturate it very quickly because there's some other VM that just try, tries to do something CPU intensive. And uh, things like Solari doesn't like it because you have to respond to pings. There are pings in the network. And when you don't get a ping in a reasonable amount of time, you say, OK, this guy is dead. Just kick him out. And we had situations where we have half of our Solari workers dead. Right? So what we did, we just increased timeout for pings, 
and right now it works reasonably well, but still we look forward into a new version of Solary to, to fix stuff. Um, also, we have problems with Docker, yeah, because we want to containerize everything to clean up automatically. So it turns, like, it turns out like if you put a lot of local hard drive um, activity, you put a lot of data inside the Docker, sometimes it doesn't clean up. Yeah, and you just run out of local space. So this is something that we fight currently with. And also, uh, duplicity has problems with scale. So it turns out that when you do backup, you can do it reasonably fast, but when you do restore, uh, it needs four times more time to, to do it uh, because uh, of how it's written. So uh, we started looking for something better, and we come up with code hold backup strategy. And um, okay, so let's think what better we can do. And this is basically something that we should start with. Uh, what's the fastest way to backup a self cluster? Yeah, it's to use another self cluster. Yeah, because self is fast, right? So if we backup self on self, it should be fast on fast. So just fast, right? Um, okay. So what do we do? We just create a separate cluster that is supposed to have just a copy of original one um, and just be dedicated to backup, right? Uh, we also thought that uh, there is a nice feature, uh, RBD export diff, RBD import diff, so basically something that, um, so basically in Ceph you can just say export me only the changes from given snapshot put some, somewhere in the time, um, and just trust me those changes. Yeah, so we thought, yeah, this, there, there must be something in it, and intuitively we said that we may have benefits here. I will show later. Yes, we had. Um, also, there's one nice, very nice property, uh, which was very crucial for us. If you have this kind of spur cluster with data of, of let's say, thousands of virtual machines, if we have disaster and our original cluster dies, what we do? We just take the spur backup cluster and just plug it into OpenStack and just start firing VMs back so you can very quickly recover. We don't have to just copy the data back to somewhere. We just take the cluster that we already have. Um, also, uh, we thought that we can reuse our previous architecture, so previous code that we did to just chop things, yeah, manage this, have these throttles everywhere. Uh, we thought that we can easily uh, use the same code. Mm. And when we have this backup cluster, and we use what we did before, so just take the, the hot backup, put it through duplicity. Yeah, we have two levels, right? Original cluster, hot backup cluster, and then called duplicity. So we still have this separate software, separate software solution, separate team. Uh, we still have the data built somewhere, and if we just break everything, there's a separate team that should have uh, data of our clients. Okay, so the architecture is actually simpler than with duplicity. So what we do, take original self cluster, do a snapshot of image. We also decided to still keep the, this uh, 25 gigabyte chunks because, because of that we can easily just, you know, uh, when there's a problem, network problem, we can just restart one part, not whole image, right? So there are some advantages of that. Take the chunk, put it through backup container, I will talk in a minute what it is, and apply it on a backup RBD image. Uh, backup container is something that we can very easily spawn next to the backup self cluster. We actually didn't need uh, that much of processing power uh, because there's no compression, no deduplication, so it's just pipe of data from one place to other. Uh, yeah. We have advantages of that uh, solution, great advantages. It turned out that we can back up very large clusters in less than 24 hours. Um, we also don't need that much computing power, yeah, because uh, we don't do this compression duplication. So we just, the data just falls through. Um, and the recovery is very fast because we can take this backup cluster and use it instead. Okay, so let's talk.
talk about how good it does work and let's bring some numbers out of EH. Okay, so first, a global statistics. Uh, right now, we actively back up 34 clusters and daily it's about 1,000 images and it is still mostly using the duplicity, uh, the old Swift based solution. So that means that we back up around roughly 0 0.6 petabytes of data daily. So it already works well, but still we can do better. So this is a case study of uh, one of our biggest clusters, which we experimented with. We actually, this is the first production cluster where we implemented uh, um, Ceph on Ceph infrastructure. Uh, we started with uh, uh, 3,350 uh, images backed up per week. So that was something that we could do um, on this cluster. It turned out that we actually didn't, wasn't able to back up whole cluster in one week uh, using the, pre the first uh, infrastructure um, because of the largest images. So the largest images, they just needed more time. Once we implemented Ceph on Ceph, that's the second uh, bar here. Uh, we still kept this seven day period and it turned out that we can back up whole cluster just easily with, within one week. So we had 4,776 uh, uh, images there and everything was being able to back up in one week. And then we shortened the amount of time to do a backup in one day and the performance spikes. That's where we implemented the diff strategy. So it shows that our intuition was right. So we start, if we start exporting diffs only, uh, we can take advantage of the fact that uh, actually in RBT images, there's only a fraction of data that changes and you don't have to re-upload all the time everything else. So it's around 10x performance improvement to the original implementation. One more nice chart. So this basically shows the age of the image. So if we uh, base uh, age of uh, backup, so if we do, do new backup, we just remove old one, right? So it just goes down to the uh, very young one. On average, uh, our images initially were about six days old. So many images we are able to actually back up more frequently than one week. But still the worst case scenario was around 1.7 week. Right? Once we started implementing Ceph to Ceph backups, we just reduced this down to around seven days. You can see some spice here. That's basically where we were fighting with Celery, Zookeeper, and that's why it doesn't always uh, work perfectly. But the most important thing is here. We switch to diffs, and suddenly we just see a drop. That's, I think, the most important from this talk. Um, uh, what you also can see that there is an initial uh, part where we still are on the self on self level without diffs. That's because you actually have to do a first backup, first full backup. Right? So it just takes a few days. Once we have the first backup done, we have uh, snapshot required, then we just start actually implementing the diffs, start uh, applying diffs instead of full backups, and that's where we can expect this reduction of time. Yeah, and similarly, this is something um, that show us if we can keep up with uh, the amount of data. So this chart shows the, um, this line shows basically uh, new images that we can back up. And the once per time window that we want to have, we just reduce it to zero. So that means that if we have total amount of 4,700 images, this line should get up to the top and cross it at some point. Uh, before we can say that we can back up everything in time. So initially for a Duplicity Swift <coughs> implementation, we were not able to get there. Once we switch to Ceph, yeah, if we just forget about this period, the trend is something that can easily cross the line. But once we add the diffs, yeah, we can very easily in one day just back up everything. Yeah, just to sum up, yeah, backups at scale are possible. Yeah, we do this. We have a lot of data and we, and we can backup it. Uh, but you should do what Ceph actually gives you. Just use the export diff. Um, and that will give you the fastest way to, to backup your data. 
uh, and it will, you can definitely uh, back up clusters which are highly utilized. In our clusters there's a lot of activity, a lot of stuff is going on 24 hours a day. And actually every 24 hours you can back up data of your clients. That's something that you can easily achieve. Actually you can even get uh, shorter backup times, but you, can, you have to watch out for, um, for the latency on the cluster because it may start uh, increasing. Um, oh, but also, even if you have self on self backups, just think about some alternative storage. Yeah, because we never know what will happen uh, and we never know what bugs can be there waiting for us uh, in the next few years. Um, and yeah, and the best thing that we have discovered is that self on self is a good as a first line backup and then just do some kind of cold backup at the end. So that will be it from my side. There were some nice images there. So this is accreditation. And a uh, few minutes for questions. Yeah. Um, when backing up uh, images of things like uh, databases and things like that, where you can't just snap the, the files that are underneath, have you done anything with that sort of workload where you have to basically have the database VM dump its database and then see it? Yeah. So the question is, uh, if we have a workload like databases, do we have any coordination uh, between the stuff that's going inside the VM, like dumping the data, uh, and our backup system? So currently we don't do this. Uh, because first we want to have the backups ready and working at the 24-hour scale. But we discussed this with uh, our colleagues at OpenStack team, because in OpenStack you can also do backups, and it has some ability to freeze local file system, do a flush, some kind of sync, and at that point do snapshot. So we want to explore this uh, in the future. Not yet implemented, but we think about this. Yeah. Yep. Uh, so, yeah, so the question was about RESTIC and uh, the fact that it supports stream. Uh, we still consider it and we want to try it in the next few months. And actually the streaming feature is very important because you don't have to have local storage, right? So that will, could be one of the benefits of uh, RESTIC. Uh, at this point in time we just focus on this hot cold strategy and want to have this first and then we will try to improve the cold, uh, the cold uh, backend. Yeah, and most likely RESTIC will be a very good candidate there. Yeah. Have you considered other candidates than RESTIC? Uh, have we considered other candidates than RESTIC? Uh, there were a few, right now I cannot recall uh, how many, but basically once we heard that other people at OVH are using duplicity, we knew that we can use their knowledge. So uh, we didn't do very huge research in that regard. Yep, I didn't. When uh, set to set backup, do you guys do less replicas on the second set cluster, or do you have an equal size cluster from, from both sides? Yeah, so uh, currently we do, an, okay, so the question was if we do self on self backup, do we have equal sized backup at the end, or do we have less replicas? So currently we are using uh, identical cluster. So the same size, the same number of replicas, uh, because when we have to do a quick switch uh, in case of failure, we can, the, the backup cluster will be able to handle the traffic. But we also consider a situation where you have totally different uh, tailored uh, hardware, especially for backup, like uh, more hard drives, uh, less, less performance, and uh, actually even two replicas out of three maybe, uh, because that will be a cost saver, right? Okay, yeah. So you said that um, in the set to set you're still taking a snapshot then chunking it and sending the chunks across. Yes. Um, does that mean that those chunks are being applied kind of each time a new chunk is written to the second set they're applied to an existing uh, block? Okay, so when we, uh, yeah, so uh, the question is when we do a chunked backup, do we reapply the chunks on the end, on, on the backup clusters? Yes, yeah, so uh, each chunk in our system is a task, 
and each task is responsible for exporting diff only of this t this chunk. Uh, we created some small script in Python where you can very easily just export only diff of one chunk. And then on the other end, we do the, something similar. We just apply something regarding only this chunk. And once we have all chunks backed up on the on the head image, then we just can finish the whole backup. Just do a snapshot at the end. Yeah. Are you still yep. Using, uh, We're still using Zookeeper. <laughs> yes. Yes, that's something that we will consider. Uh, we, I think we were thinking about etcd. Uh, but right now, we just solved uh, our major problems and started focusing on <laughs> uh, increasing our infrastructure. So it's something definitely that will be on our roadmap. Yeah. OK. That's all, that's all I got. So thanks for the meeting. <laughs>